Good morning, everybody. This is Donna Frosser, Chief Clinical Officer at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And we're here to bring you a COVID-19 update with the World Health Organization today. Um, I know we haven't done one of these in a long time and our friend Ed Kelly has moved on to, to, to better things beyond the World Health Organization, if that's even possible. Um, and so today we are so excited to be, to be joined by Dr. Priyanka Raylon. She's a technical officer at the World Health Organization. And she's also a clinician who is currently caring for COVID patients. Welcome Priyanka. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for joining and for having me be part of this webinar series. I have very, very, very big shoes to fill as of Dr. Kelly's departure, but it is my honor to be here and to talk with you today um, about COVID-19 updates from, from WHO. Um, as Donna mentioned, um, I'm a clinician. I'm an emergency medicine specialist uh, trained physician. Um, and I work here at the WHO headquarters in um, the clinical management team for COVID-19, as well as um, on the uh, clinical services and systems team, which, which helps with um, strengthening health systems um, for countries around the world. And um, that's where I've been working with Dr. Kelly um, for, for the last over a year. Um, but uh, it's really great to be here. And so today I will, I will speak with you about some updates from, um, on COVID-19 um, from WHO and um, really happy to take any questions and, and discuss further after the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Priyanka. But real quick, before you get started, I just want to be able to say that uh, the, we, we are providing CE credit today for board certified patient advocates. I apologize, that's the only CE that we are able to provide, but um, we will give you 1.0 credits for that. Um, if you did register as a patient advocate, then you'll get an email within five to seven days from us here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation with your, uh, with your certificate. So um, with that being said, I'm going to pass it back to Priyanka and I'm going to, um, I, I, will, I will be muting or monitoring the Q&A in the chat. So please enter your questions there and we will get to all of them at the end. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Donna. All right, so um, I'm going to sp uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the current situation, um, our current updates epidemiologically, and what's been going on sort of globally and, and by regions, and give a little bit of history on, the, on what's going on with the vaccines at the moment, which is a really exciting new update from the last time you probably heard from Ed. So I will say there's at least a really great price for us um, in the updates. Um, and then I'm going to speak a little bit about um, strengthening the clinical system, again, from my clinical perspective um, in the in health systems, but also through the clinical COVID-19 response. Um, and I'll focus a little bit on, on safety since that's, that's where we're, where, <laughs> that's where I'm speaking, the audience that I'm speaking to today. Um, and again, really happy to discuss more details um, through questions or through later discussions as well. And the final thing is um, I'll just mention is some safe practices during Ramadan as today uh, we did start the Ramadan uh, season and, um, and it's an important consideration for, for current times. So um, to start off with, um, we have had um, increasing cases over the last couple of weeks. Um, what you can see here is over the last week, um, we've had 4,450,000 new confirmed cases and 75 1,597 new deaths that have been reported to us. Um, this is as of just a couple of days ago. Overall, um, 134 million confirmed, around 135 million confirmed new cases, and uh, about almost getting 50 million deaths, unfortunately. Um, the majority of the new cases, as you can see here, have over the last 24 hours of new cases and new deaths have been reported coming from the US for, for new cases. Um, and, uh, and deaths mostly in, in Brazil um, and, um, and in India. And then here you can see the epi curve that, um, by the WHO region. Um, again, you can see most of the new cases um, in the European region and in the region of the Americas. Um, and then deaths as well, just increasing. Um, we had a little bit of a dip in the summer, but, um, but again, sort of on the, on the upsurge trend in recent weeks. And then here you can see a um, distribution by the WHO region separately. Um, you can see lots of sort of um, waves, um, second waves, especially in, in the Africa region, um, also in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Americas. 
um, and a bit of uh, increase in the new cases in Europe as well here. Um, Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific, we've all everywhere globally to see that the, the cases have been on the upward consistently. Um, so last week we had, as I said, around 4.5 million cases and nearly 76,000 deaths. Um, mostly, um, as I mentioned, in Brazil and India as countries, but in the region wise, um, Southeast Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, we're seeing, unfortunately, some, you know, with the, the resurgence of, of COVID, as we'll say, in this sort of second wave, third wave, some countries are facing a fourth wave. Um, that uh, there has been some um, complacency on the uh, public health measures, um, the opening and, and, and um, unfortunately uh, not to maintaining the um, public health measures in, in, uh, in settings and in, um, in, in crowd settings and in, um, in workplaces, etc. So we continue to emphasize the need for public health measures and physical distancing, um, social gatherings, which again I'll mention now with Ramadan um, being an important consideration, hand hygiene and masks. Um, for vaccines, um, everyone has heard about the COVAX facility, I would hope, um, at this stage. And uh, so uh, for COVAX, um, we've shipped around 36 million doses to 86 countries. Um, and this is actually a little bit older. We have some, some um, increase in numbers in the last week. Um, but really exciting to know that the campaigns have started in so many different economies and that um, there's been uh, lots of vaccines now started in, in low and middle income countries, particularly in Africa. We've seen lots of new um, vaccine shipments every day to new countries, and that's been um, that's been very encouraging. However, um, we we have heard in, in the last couple of days, especially um, in the media, that uh, our our DG has um, has highlighted to the world that uh, there's still an enormous amount of vaccine inequity um, that we're seeing across the world. On average, um, in high income countries, um, almost one in four people have received the COVID vaccine. Whereas in low income countries, it's about one in 500. Um, it's quite a staggering amount of vaccine inequity. So there is a lot of work to be done in that side. Um, and here you can see a little bit about the distribution. Again, this is um, information from a few, well, more than a few days ago, but, uh, but again, highlighting that um, around 41% of low income countries have not started vaccination. Um, and uh, even a, 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 almost a fifth of the world middle income countries, again, by, um, by World Bank certification, have not started vaccinations, whereas only 1% of high income countries um, had not started vaccinations, the majority of them have. Um, so there's an enormous amount of um, need to, to help bring the vaccine to, to the rest of the globe. And um, another thing I'll highlight from our other colleague, um, Dr. Lynn Kirchhoff, she said that uh, very um, importantly earlier today, the, vac the variants, um, the fatigue, and the fact that we've been having this uneven vaccine distribution has contributed to the, to the rise, to so this resurgence that I mentioned. Um, and we, we need to just, we need to do it all. All of those public health measures are critical to uh, keep encouraging and um, keep and maintaining that um, physical distance, but also social closeness and encouraging others to also um, engage in all of the public health measures, including vaccination, but all of everything else in PC as well. Um, so what the way that we are supporting countries into doing that um, is through our, one of the ways is, is through um, guidance and translating our, our evidence into action. Um, so I'm going to speak a bit more about uh, tools and our trainings, etc. But um, firstly, a bit more about how we get this evidence into into action. Um, and so here you see a, a many pictures of um, of WHO guidance and our trainings and tools, um, and a little bit more about how these uh, guidelines are developed. So again, on the right side, you see so, uh, the, the clinical management guidance, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but important to understand that we're doing this on a very, very rapid pace, um, more than, you know, faster than we've ever done it before. Um, generally, as it's said here, if the guidelines of WHO are developed in six months or sometimes six years, 
Um, but we've been able to do these guidelines and make these guidelines in a matter of weeks sometimes um, and update them quite regularly throughout the pandemic. Um, and it's important that we've been able to do this to make to keep up with uh, the evidence, keep up with the science, and, and really keep up with all of the different um, considerations that countries and economies have had to face in this difficult time. And so we've got lots of different networks, um, clinical networks, and um, networks of expertise um, in different areas, including um, environmental science and engineering and um, and uh, in infection prevention and control and social sciences and behavior, um, epidemiology, and of course, clinical networks, um, which, is, um, which have all come together and been able to generate, uh, generate a lot of evidence uh, together, helping to make um, protocols together, do studies together, different types of, um, of methodologies, and uh, review publications, review peer prints, and then bring it all together through these, this guideline development process. Um, which we, we use um, with a, a, in collaboration with our science division here. We, in the clinical side, we use um, the grade process for, for grading guidelines and making recommendations with our expert networks, um, make recommendations with our guideline development groups, and then ensure that they're peer reviewed and they're quality assured um, through peer partner agencies. Like sometimes we'll have MSF, for example, review the guidelines. Um, and ensure that they're actually implemented, implementable, <laughs> uh, can be implemented um, on the ground. Um, and then, you know, always engaging with so many of our other networks that we've, we've been able to develop through, uh, through the pandemic um, in different, in, in, in out ex executing the, um, the know to the world and letting, letting them know about um, all of the guidelines and the, and the documents through these different avenues as you see here on the right side with, for example, the Information Network for Epidemics um, and the WHO Academy, um, other websites and other, other ways that we've been able to disseminate um, the information. And at the same time, again, having to do this quite rapidly, but making sure that we don't compromise the quality of the information and the quality that goes into the process and the methods of um, of what we're saying or what what the evidence uh, what the evidence says it does it's quite an art and it's um and it's it's been uh, an incredible process to to see here and to to be able to support the, the countries in different ways and in making standardized processes and standardized tools to to help support them um, clinically and in every other uh, sector as well. So when we talk about quality. Um, you know, I mentioned there the quality of the, of the methods and the quality of the processes of developing guidelines. I'm going to switch a little bit now and talk more about quality as it pertains to um, patient care and um, at the you know at the facility level, at the healthcare level, patient to provider level, which you all will be quite familiar with. Um, and uh, this is a quote from our director general. Um, again, another quote, and he says, "The quality is not a given. It takes vision, planning, investment, compassion." meticulous execution, rigorous monitoring from the national level to the smallest remotest clinic. And um, he said it very eloquently, and I think it, it pertains to many different ways that we think about quality, um, but especially, you know, what I'll, what I'll move to now in, in sort of the patient level. So when we talk about quality, as you guys will, many of you will know, uh, from the Institute of Medicine, the, the different domains of quality, uh, what they are, what does quality mean? Um, and you, you see that here, the different domains. Um, of course, one of them is being safety, um, avoiding harm to people for whom the care is intended. But there's also these other domains. So uh, effectiveness of, of an intervention. So providing evidence-based health services to those who need them, so evidence-based. Um, efficiency, we want to maximize the benefit of available resources. Uh, integration, we want to make sure that the care that we're providing um, is coordinated across the levels, it's coordinated between providers, and that it's available throughout all ages of, uh, that the patient will, um, will go to. Equity, we want to make sure that care is provided um, for regardless of age or gender or any of the other factors. Timeliness, we want to make sure that care is, um, is not done with delay, it's not given with delay. Um, because we know that harmful delays can, um, can cause a negative outcome. 
and friendly people-centeredness, people ensuring that the care that we are giving um, responds to individual preferences, to their values, to the needs of the person. Um, so when we think about care for patients of, with COVID-19, these are some of the ways that each of the elements of quality that I just mentioned um, are relating to, to COVID-19. So for example, um, in safety, staffing challenges can increase the susceptibility to safety events. Um, so we need uh, novel therapies, um, we need novel therapies for COVID-19, but we also need careful regulation and observation of those therapies. Um, and timeliness, for example, outcomes can be improved through timely diagnosis and timely identification and deterioration. So constant monitoring of patients um, and ensuring that care that's provided to them and um, any deterioration that may happen to them is it monitored, it's caught very early on um, and taken care of and intervened on very quickly. So every aspect of mild patients, moderate patients, severe patients, they all need to be monitored at, at different intervals, um, but ensuring that there is a, there's a mechanism to be able to care for them once, that, if once something is noted, um, the, if their condition change has been noted. Um, so I won't read through all of these, but this is some of the ways that, um, that care for patients with COVID-19 is, um, is impacted by the different quality elements. And then when we talk about um, maintaining the, addition, the rest of the health services, so here we are we're talking about not only patients who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, but patients mm -hmm. who may be diagnosed with any other disease or any other illness, and really at a, even at a, at a bigger level, the different health services that are provided across different health services, so for across primary care, from primary care to the surgical care, um, we want to make sure no matter what that, for example, equity, um, that COVID-19 control measures are not limited across the different population groups um, between different patients who may require surgical treatment to patients who require vaccinations for, you know, for not for COVID, but for other vaccine, routine vaccinations. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to, to sort of slice and dice the different elements of quality, depending on if we're looking at the, the system level or the, the patient level. But all of these are important considerations um, uh, as, we, as, we talk, as we think about uh, patient care. Um, so next thing I want to mention is um, a bit about how we're helping countries with supporting them in uh, enhancing their quality and safety of patients um, at the clinical level. So um, as an emergency care physician here at WHO, I, um, I support in the um, strengthening emergency care systems of, of um, countries nationally and at the facility level. And so we look at, um, when we talk about an emergency care system, we, we break it up like this. This is our, our framework. Um, um, this framework is available online. Um, behind this framework is uh, all the health system building blocks. And um, what you see here is just a pictorial about how we've, how we've thought about um, what it takes to get a patient. For example, here it's the little girl who's fallen down or um, is on the ground. Um, and how, what it takes to get that patient and that little girl to the care that she needs um, at the facility. And um, what you see here is, for example, you know, there's a, there's a, there's the girl who's, who has an acute illness or an injury um, this scene, it doesn't have to be on the road. I mean, it looks like it's a road right now, but it could be, you know, at a school, it could be at a store, it could be anywhere, um, even at home. Um, what, it, what it first requires is this recognition from somebody else that something just happened to this, to this little girl. And that recognition is, of course, the first step. Then uh, what you see here is this person with a phone. Then it requires this person to be able to number one, have a phone, to have data on the phone, or have connection on the phone, to, for there to be a number to call, potentially, um, a, you know, ideally a three-digit number uh, for them to call. And for someone on that, for when they call that number, for someone on the other line to be able to pick up the phone and be able to give some kind of instructions and be able to support this person. Except, so you see there's, there's already in this first to your first stage, there's a lot of different functions that need to occur in order for this patient um, to, to obtain the care that she needs in a timely fashion, that, that quality, safe, effective, efficient, timely, et cetera, care that she needs. Um, and so this picture describes um, all of those functions that are needed in, in blue. Uh, the human resources that are needed are the red text and the equipment and the supplies and the technology that are needed are in green. And another thing I'll highlight here is that 
Um, this applies not to just to pediatric patients, of course. This applies to patients who are adults who may have some kind of other conditions, such as chest pain, which may end up being a heart attack. Um, it can apply to, of course, low traffic injuries or any kind of trauma, uh, falls, etc. It can apply to pregnant patients who may have profuse bleeding or, or have some other complication or, um, of pregnancy, and then, of course, to pediatric patients. This is just some examples to say that emergency care, as we know, can ha anything can happen to anyone, anywhere. And that is, um, that is what, this whole system and the activation of the system uh, is important for all. So but what we've done with them, when we help support countries in this, we have helped them look at each element of the emergency care system, as I described, from scene to transport, um, to handover, from, from transport to facility-based care. And uh, what we've done over the last several years is to help, when we help countries look at these, um, at their national level assessment and do the national level assessments and assess their gaps, we see a lot of the same gaps that come across the many different countries. So for example, um, one here you see is a lack of bystander protection. Many countries have, have told us that they have um, limited bystander protection or no universal access coverage number. So like I said, like a 911 or a 112, et cetera. A lot of countries don't, that doesn't exist. Um, and so on and so forth. I won't read all of these, but you get the idea. There's lots of similar different gaps across different countries. And so, um, so here's another example of triage and resuscitation capacity. So when we, we've done this assessment in about 40 countries now, and um, in countries will then tell us about what kinds of um, gaps that they have and where they want to target the, the priorities, um, what they want to, where they want to target the intervention, what are their, their top priorities across, the, across the, um, the whole system, the emergency care system. Um, and so you see here a, a few different examples of the types of priorities that countries have identified. Um, for example, a lot of countries are told that they need training, a lot of countries are told about the hospital systems. And so we've, over the, over the last several years, um, we've developed lots of these different tools to help support them in uh, filling the gaps. And so there's tools here, for example, a triage tool, um, uh, basic emergency care, which is our clinical care uh, course that we developed with ICRC. Um, some different ways that we can support them in quality improvement exercises um, through, audit, through having uh, registries that have um, that can flag cases that have that are preventable with bad out, um, bad outcomes are preventable. So um, with audit filters and things like that, um, and uh, and of course some standards and protocols. Again, these are just some examples. There's a whole bunch of other tools as well that are available um, on our website, and so. What I want to highlight here is some of the tools that are specifically designed um, for improving the quality and the safety of the care of patients in the emergency unit setting and in the clinical setting in general. And so, for example, I'll start with patients coming in. Um, and the first thing that we, we sort of talk about is triaging the patient. So sorting the patient according to how sick they are, not according to what time they came in or what age they have. You know, um, but really just based on how, how, how acutely ill they are. And then moving them into a designated resuscitation area if they need, um, if they're sort of true as a dread or critical. Um, some of the different um, tech, some of the different process tools that we can implement in the, in the emergency unit, for example, will be sort of checklists at the patient level that will support in patient safety um, and quality and provide care for them uh, through the basic emergency care course. Um, and then and then move them forward through the rest of the um, the rest of the patient pathway. And so when we talk about adapting this to COVID, um, one of the things that we've done in our in our guidance since um, since the summertime, and it's been um, evolved since then, um, is to is to think about how patients when they arrive to the facility in the COVID era, what what are all the different processes that need to happen. Um, so what you see here is. Patients who are arriving to the health system in general, whether it's through an ambulance, as I mentioned, in the emergency, in an emergency, or maybe they walk into a pharmacy, or maybe they walk into a clinic, or they walk into a hospital, however they access the health system, they, they should get screened at that time um, for, for symptoms of COVID. And if they have COVID, um, you know, the, the next, if it's a health provider who's been trained in triage, they can, they can you know, quickly assess a patient and see if they are critical or if they're 
you know, if they can, um, if they can get to a facility and it uh, needs to get to a facility urgently, or they can go back to their house, etc. Um, but uh, but they, it, especially in the facility level, um, there should be an acuity-based triage system, and then a formal clinical assessment with a, with a healthcare provider who does the um, physical examination, the history taking, and um, lab breakdown and radiology, etc. The full assessment. And then, of course, treatment based on how, how sick they are, and finally released from the pathway, meaning uh, when they can sort of um, dis discharge their, their infection prevention and control measures. Um, so, when you can say they're safely um, not going to be transmitting COVID. And so, what we've done over the last several, well, last, actually now over a year that we've been in this pandemic, is talk about the, the different ways that we have these emergency care tools that I mentioned previously, how they fit into the COVID world. And so what you see here is I'm just clicking through, oops, sorry, just clicking through the different tools. Um, as I mentioned, the triage tool that was developed with our colleagues in ICRC and the second and FRC, um, the checklist and et cetera, the basic emergency care for. So it all fits into the way that we care for a COVID patient. Basically all of it's to say, patients who present to the hospital or present to the clinic or present to anywhere, we don't know if they have COVID based on when they present. We, we, they just have symptoms. And they need to be cared for according to how sick they are rather than what kind of diagnosis they have. So this is something that we constantly try to discuss with, the, um, with our country colleagues um, in, in terms of not having COVID-specific areas, but with with proper FEC measures, having suspected and confirmed COVID patients separated, cohorted separately, and um, and screening and triaging them appropriately according to again according to to the um, severity of disease. So, a couple of the tools that I'll dive into just a little bit deeper. Um, again, because how, showing how they how they improve quality and in some cases also improve safety. So, first thing with the triage tool. Um, it's an emergency unit triage protocol, which um, many of you may be familiar with, for example, the Emergency Severity Index or um, the Manchester triage uh, um, tool, etc. There's many different types of triage tool. Um, this one, the one that we worked on with and developed with um, our colleagues in ICRC and MSF, um, is, uh, is a three-color, very simple tool. Um, that's meant to be used by TF nurses and very um, for, for our, our techs, et cetera, depending on who, who, who is uh, trained at the facility level. And you see here how some different ways that um, it, it can improve the quality of care. So it can certainly improve timeliness because it will allow um, the early identification of time sensitive conditions. It'll improve the efficiency of care that is delivered to the patient, to the entire population of um, those who have access to the health system. And it'll improve equity because there won't be there won't be any bias as to age or to gender or to etc. It's it's blanketly looking at the whole population and deciding who needs care first and how can we optimize the resources we have to provide the best care for the most. So this is a picture of the triage tool. Um, again, it's available online, um, but you can see here it's a it's a simple red, yellow, green type of um, uh, type of different, that categorization across. Um, and divided into the ABCDE type of uh, approach to the patient. And then the second um, tool that I'll talk about um, is the checklist. And so we have two different types of checklists, the medical emergency checklist and the trauma care checklist. Again, for use um, for clinical providers in emergency units and ideally in a resuscitation area where those are available um, for doctors, for nurses, in both adults and children. And some of the ways that this improves um, the quality of care is Number one, they can improve the effectiveness of the care. So they can reinforce um, the different considerations that are that are not to be missed um, in the care of the patient. It's not that every patient, of course, will have um, all of the questions answered, but it's the, the questions should be considered for every patient. Um, and that's the point. These these things, these particular points have been carefully selected and carefully piloted and validated in several countries and several clinical environments. Um, as being the key items not to miss for patients with medical emergencies and not to be missed for patients with trauma. It certainly reduces the risk of harm in that way that um, things are not forgotten, things are not left, um, things are not, are not delayed, and that's also um, part of the time limits. And um, if there is an, uh, there's a question on there um, about uh, was the care plan of care to, um, dis um, discussed with the patient and the family. 
And so in that regard, it helps to teach people some fitness also because it promotes the dialogue and promotes um, shared decision making and ensuring that, that those involved with the care of the patient on the patient side are all informed about what is happening. And then the final tool I'll just talk about in this way is, um, is the resuscitation area um, designation. And this is helping facility planners and, and emergency unit managers, et cetera, to help them design um, segregate an area, part of the emergency unit that's just designated for the sickest of the sickest patients. And this improves the quality of care because it allows for reorganization of the resources and to optimize the, the flow of patients and, um, and the timeliness of the care that can be provided to the sickest patients. Um, so those are some examples of the WHO tools that can help improve quality and safety of care. Um, these tools, in addition to the course modules out of the basic emergency care course, um, are included in a, a few of the educational platforms and training, um, training resources for COVID-19 and, and also generally um, for uh, strengthening health systems everywhere because again, patients don't necessarily present with that diagnosis. Um, and so these are available on the WHO Academy COVID-19 mobile application, which you can download um, from the Apple Store or Google Play. And also on openwho.org, um, there's a COVID-19 course, clinical course series on the clinical management channel, which is currently under development. Um, and we have two courses released already on um, the rehabilitation course, which talks a lot about long COVID or post COVID uh, complications, as well as the general considerations course and um, the emergency care course, the course that has these, these tools and these trainings um, is, is to be, due to be released in, in a matter of couple of days. Um, so they released this week so you can keep your eyes eyes peeled for that. Um, moving a little bit, uh, just talking about UHC in general. On the next slide I'll actually describe what um, what we mean by UHC just as a reminder for, for those um, who who aren't as uh, as used to hearing this term this WHO terminology as um, as others. But uh, this, this is just highlighting that um, overall, the health system challenges that countries have been facing um, have a lot to do with the, the delivery of, of quality health services, is what I've described. Um, but as more of a global picture, it, we look at, um, and you know, across countries and across sectors, we're helping to strengthen health systems and not only the clinical services, but of course, through supply chain, um, through medicines, through products, um, and, and what you see here is continuing with the UN framework for socioeconomic response. Um, and this is a lot of the, the joint efforts um, with across UN agencies and WHO leading on the, on the health first um, piece of protecting health services and systems during, during COVID-19. So if, when we talk about, again, this is a reminder to everyone about what we mean by UHC, talking about equity to access to health services, ensuring that the quality of the health services are good enough to improve the health of the person. And we talked about what we mean by quality. And um, importantly, that the, the services that are provided um, are, are of no, of not, do not put the patient at any financial risk. Um, and so this, this is what we mean by allowing, allowing universal health coverage um, for, for all those who are accessing health services. And certainly emergency care has been, um, has been discussed at the global level across all member states uh, to be an essential part of universal health coverage as are many other aspects of, of clinical service delivery, but particularly the tools that I highlighted um, have, been, have been specifically named as an essential for, for universal health coverage for all countries. And all of that, we, when we, we talk about emergency care, primary care, critical care, all the different services, we, we, we encourage that to be discussed under the, the umbrella of a primary health center, I'm sorry, primary health care oriented health systems approach. Um, so we know that PHC oriented health systems are the most resilient health systems. And by that, we mean this, we have this spectrum of of the way that um, patients can access the health system and their interlinkages with each other. So emergency care systems um, can allow, we want to ensure that they, the follow-up of the patients is connected to the primary care providers, that the critical care services are, are interlinked with um, the emergency care services, that you know, trauma, for example, is, is a cross-section, cross-service uh, uh, in, integrated approach to caring for the trauma patients with surgical care as well. So we've 
we also we, we want to ensure that all of these services are speaking to one another all of it is done under this um, uh, to, together across the health system, across in the hospital, but also across the, the, the region or the country and, and across the, um, the whole country. So, um, so that's what we mean by, by PHC approach. Um, so just getting to the end here, the last thing I wanted to just quickly talk about as, um, as we are in that, in that time now with, uh, with Ramadan um, is to uh, talk about uh, safe practices during this time of, of mass potential mass gatherings. Um, so we want to ensure that um, countries uh, have and, and people um, understand that the risks of, of coming together and um, consider doing a risk evaluation and risk communications. We have some tools and some guidance that has been recently released and recently updated from last year and released um, around safe practices for Ramadan. Um, and we encourage considering other alternatives for, for gathering together um, instead of doing so visibly or doing so virtually. And always, of course, uh, precautionary measures, um, all the ones that we mentioned before about um, for, uh, for safety and for public health. Um, vaccinations will continue during Ramadan, and we are we're certainly encouraging encourage, encourage that. Um, including um, supporting religious leaders to also advocate for a continuation of the campaigns um, and to continue to exercise all the precautionary measures, um, even for those who are vaccinated um, during this time. And the final thing is just do it all, not only during Ramadan, but always um, do everything that, that we've talked about with all the public health measures in order to stop the transmission, to avoid needing emergency care, to avoid needing any kind of clinical care. Um, so we still need all these things to be done all the time. And, um, and that way we can, we can help bring this pandemic to an end as quickly as possible. Um, I think I talked quite fast, but I apologize. <laughs> but I'm happy to take any questions um, and discuss further. And um, yeah, thank you. Back to you, Dana. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Priyanka. What great information. Um, we did have a question from the audience asking whether or not um, the slides would be available. Um, is the, are the slides something you can share with us? Sorry, I muted myself. Yes, absolutely. Yes, can do. Okay, okay. Excellent, excellent. Great. Um, and other questions from the audience. I don't have any questions. I don't have anything in the chat. So um, if you have any questions for Priyanka, please uh, uh, please enter them now into either the chat box or the Q&A. So Priyanka, um, thank you again so much for this wonderful information. We really appreciate your time today. And um, and I just I, I do have one question for you. I do have one question. Being on the front lines. Um, you know, what is the one thing that um, that you can say to clinicians who are struggling with caring for COVID patients right now and struggling with the mental health challenges um, ar mm -hmm. around that? What was what's the one thing that you can say to them? I I would say solidarity. I think um, everyone everyone is everyone is burnt out i would say in some way shape or form i mean we're all we're all caring for each other and caring for uh, our patients and our families and you know it's, it's affecting every part of our lives um for you know a lot of different ways and i think especially for clinicians who are seeing you know, we're seeing the patients um up close and personal and seeing a lot of the ways that it's, it's affecting them sort of especially at the end of their lives but even even throughout you know different ways that Again, vaccine equity is, is affecting them, or their their ability to, to receive the, the chronic care that you know, the care that they need for, for maintaining their routine health, um, and and just being able to access different types of services across this time. It's 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 in every way. Someone everyone is going through something, and um, so I would say the the thing that you could do to help with that is is talk to each other and be there for each other. I mean, you know, we're we're all struggling with that, and we we need to be able to um, rely on each other, and that's that's the solidarity of of being together in this time. It's an incredibly unique time, and um, and I think that's that's what's been able to to help our clinician colleagues um, join up and and be able to uh, to rely on each other, support each other, listen. And uh, and be be gentle and kind. 
to displace that photon. Hello, Priyanka, are you there? Yes, hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, what is the, what is the, um, the, your estimate for uh, how long until we get herd immunity globally? Oh, um, well, that's, that's really dependent on how we do with all these public health measures that we're talking about. We're seeing, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing, unfortunately, an increase in cases right now. And, um, and uh, you know, and the vaccine inequity. So it's it's a we're a sort of at a double edged sword at the moment um, with um, with both both sides. And so it's 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 hard to give an estimate, uh, especially again with you know Ramadan and lots of lots of different uh, considerations during this time. So um, so it's really impossible to give an estimate, but really to encourage everyone um, to to practice uh, all the all the public health measures. Keep Keep doing, um, keep, keep washing your hands and keep the mask on even when you're vaccinated um, to, to help prevent the, the transmission of the disease. Um, and of course, of course, across when we're, when we're thinking about, um, you know, how are the variants going to affect um, the, um, the, the case numbers, um, you know, we, we need to ensure that we're, we're constantly keeping all the public health measures in place so we can, we can get to that herd immunity point as quickly as possible. Um, so unfortunately, not a, not a great answer, but not that we don't have, we're really just encouraging everyone to, to get us there as quickly as possible. Great, thank you. You know, there's also a lot of concern about, about the variants that we hear about. So um, can you speak a little bit about what we know about how effective the vaccines are going to be against those variants? Yeah, I could speak a little bit about it, but I could also maybe send some information um, to my to my colleagues who are who are working on the vaccines more more deeply than I am. Um, but uh, but you know, there's there's been different studies um, looking at the effectiveness of different variants, especially these days. Um, and um, and it's uh, you know there's there's different way different things that we know about the, the different vaccines, but in general, uh, what we're seeing is that. Um, with, with two doses or with the full full course of the of the approved vaccines that we are getting um, a good effectiveness uh, for for achieving um, for achieving prevention of the disease or some some poor outcomes of uh, you know, severe disease or critical disease. Um, so it depends. Of course, all this depends on the on the vaccine. It depends on the variants and sort of how they interlink. And there's a lot still to be to be learned about that. Um, but for the ones that are approved and, and the full dose, um, it, there is shown to be at least good effective for the, for the major variants that are out there right now. Great. And, uh, you know, this morning here in the United States, there's breaking news about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and just a handful of people who are having a very rare uh, reaction to that. Also AstraZeneca um, over there in Europe with, you know, the issue with blood clots that have been coming up. So can you talk about that? You know what? What's what's happening with um, with vaccine distribution in these cases? Is there any kind of pause, and and is it happening globally or in just certain regions? Yeah. So countries are taking the country approach to to how to what to do with the rollout of all the vaccines. Um, yeah, we, we did see this um, come out today, and and um, you know it is something that unfortunately that that um, that we you know that is. That is something that we have to address um, globally as well. And, um, but I think um, every country is, is sort of evaluating the, the risks individual, uh, country by country. And we've seen some of the risk estimates for the AstraZeneca. Um, and so we'll continue to see a little bit more about the J&J &J as well. Um, but uh, yes, it's, it, for us, it's also a new, um, new ongoing development, and so I, I don't have an exact answer about what we'll say total sort, sort of at the, at the global level, but um, something that we need to keep a very, very close eye on and um, continue to see what the other, what the other countries are doing and, and still have a, a bit more, you know, a lot to learn about, about these sort of, um, uh, these types of effects that we're seeing across the, the A to C vaccines that we've heard about um, with the, with the 
for those on the phone who you know may not have a clinical background, maybe um, you know part of the, the, the general public, um, how much concern do you think that they should have about about these side effects? Well, um, you know, I think it's something that um, really should be discussed with the with your provider, um, with your clinical provider, um, and their. Um, you know, what we know right now is that we, we're not able to identify any kind of particular risk factors. Um, you know, most of what well, most of what we know about this is. is um, but uh, that you know, we know that a lot of the cases have been happening. And in a certain age, um, an age group under 60 years. Um, so th there's a lot of lot of things that we do know, um, but still much, much more that we don't. So I would encourage for those of you who are questions about it and, and you're considering what should I do, which one should I get, um, to really discuss with your with your primary clinician or with um, with your um, with, a, with your clinical colleagues um, and to review sort of what the national and your local guidelines are are, are suggesting um, and consider asking asking lots of questions to, to your colleagues as well and, and seeing what works best for you. Every every patient, of course, is going to have you're going to have your own um, profile of what um, what is uh, great as far as your, your age, your risk factors, your other your other comorbidities, etc. Um, so it's important to to consider that and to take it very individualistically. I would say um, in the in the context of what's happening in your local area and in your country. Great. Do we also have a question about getting attendance certificates for this webinar? And they and um, calls it a brilliant webinar. Thank you so much, Priyanka, for your brilliant webinar today. Um, and um, just to let everybody know, the only the only continuing education credit that we are able to offer for this particular webinar today is for board certified patient advocates. So anybody who registered as a BCPA will get, a, get a, an, atten a, a, an attendance certificate in the mail for that particular certification. If anybody else um, is not looking for certification but just wants validation that you did in fact attend the webinar, then please just let us know. Um, you can email us at, at clinical at patientsafetymovement.org and we can help you out with that. Okay, any other questions? It doesn't look like we have any other questions so far. Okay, well, Priyanka, thank you so very much for joining us today. This is very enjoyable. I hope to have you back again in a couple of months to tell us what, what else is new happening on the COVID front there. <laughs> There'll be lots of developments, I'm sure, but uh, it would it would be my honor, and and uh, I know that we all have we'll have potentially um, other other colleagues as well filled out as very very big big shoes. Um, so uh, so we'll be in touch, and it'd be it'd be great to reconnect with you all sometime some way. Um, and in the meantime, please everyone keep safe and take care of yourselves. Um, get vaccinated when you can, if you can, and uh, and um, take care of one another. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Very well said. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.